Uh, welcome to the uh, Monday morning data chat. Uh, happy Monday, everybody. Matt, good, good to see morning, you. Bill. And, good, uh, to see you. good to see you again. Bill. Morning. <laughs> hey, Thank good you. Morning. Yeah, of course. So, um, yeah, so we got uh, Bill Inman on the uh, Monday morning data chat today. So, uh, really excited uh, to talk to you. I think we're going to take the conversation in a um, an interesting direction as well. I'm sure you get asked a ton about um, data warehousing. That's uh, you know kind of what you're known for. I, I think we also want to talk about um text which i know is a subject that's near and dear to you so um yeah awesome so yeah what's um what's let's talk about text let's just jump right into that like why um I mean, you, you have a very storied career in data and i think um have a lot of context what about text uh really interests you and captivates you well i think the thing about text is is that there is tremendous business value in text that's being ignored by the organizations today. And, and that business value is, uh, 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 is uh, uh, not going to be ignored forever. Let mm. me give you just one example of, of, uh, of, of, of text and business value being ignored. Let's go to the uh, EHR, Electronic Health Records. Uh, it, EHR was designed for one doctor and for one patient. And for that purpose, it, it does a really good job. What EHR was not designed for was looking at 10,000 patients at the same time. And, and because if you ever take a look at an uh, electronic health record, uh, you find that the majority of that record is in the form of text. And, 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 uh, 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 and, when, and, and, and the problem is, is that text has got to be read manually. That's that's the Achilles heel of text. That uh, 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 and and so what happens is 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 that if you need to look at ten thousand or a hundred thousand patients at the same time, you can't do it with the uh, electronic healthcare record. And so that's just one of many many examples of a tremendous value being locked up uh, in the form of text that. Uh, uh, is going to be unlocked. But let me tell you something. That's just one example. I I could go on and you don't want me to go on and on, but I could. We generally like it when you go on and on. Actually, you always have interesting things to say. But let me ask this. I mean, from your perspective, why are organizations ignoring text? Why are they not getting any value out of it? There's lots of reasons. The, the, the basic reason is, is that the standard database management system is designed to handle transaction data, data that is repetitive, data like uh, 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 retailing records from Walmart or, or, or records of phone calls from AT&T, you name it, and, and the database management systems are designed to handle repetitive data. When it comes to non-repetitive data, and believe me, text is non-repetitive, uh, when it comes to non-repetitive data, uh, 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 you, you, uh, non-repetitive data does not fit well within a database management system. There's a second reason why, why, why text is, is, uh, is so difficult is that text requires not only the text, but the context that, that mm -hmm. you, you, you really and truly just analyzing text is, doesn't do you any good. Uh, 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 you've got to also look at context and, and, and organizations are not used to understanding that they have to deal with context as, as, as well as text. So those, now there are other reasons as well. Uh, and I don't want, I don't think it's interesting or I don't think we have time to go into some of the other reasons, but, uh, the main reason is standard database management systems do not handle text well. And standard database management systems uh, don't have the, 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 they do have, standard database management systems do have the notion of, of context, but it's quite different in a world of structured systems. Uh, uh, the free form context that you have to deal with in, in text is not something that standard database management systems has, have ever had to deal with. So those are, and there are other reasons as well, but those are, oh, I'll tell you one, one other reason. One other reason is text comes in different languages. It's, it's certainly we understand English and that's great and wonderful, 
But I got news for you. There's Spanish and Portuguese and Arabic and uh, uh, and, and Chinese. And I mean, uh, uh, one of the complicating factors is when you deal with text, you've also got to deal with uh, the challenge of dealing with multiple languages. That's really interesting. So if relational systems aren't great with text, what are there systems that are better suited for it? Um, at the risk of 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 uh, talking about something that I have a personal interest in, I'm going to go ahead and tell you there is technology today that can take text and turn text into a standard relational database management system, and that that technology is something called textual ETL, and textual ETL can read the text and turn text into a standard relational database management system. Okay, so in that process, first of all, what do you gain as you convert it into relations and structured data? And then <laughs> frankly, what, what do you lose? Like I assume you lose something in that process. Maybe this is really good for certain processing and not so good for other processing. What do you gain? Uh, what you gain is this, is if you're dealing with medical records, now you can look at 10,000 records at the same time. You can sit there and say, this doctor's got 10,000 patients and, uh, 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 and the doctor uh, 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 needs to look at uh, what are, for example, the corresponding factors to COVID. That's, a, that's an example that we all know. And so is it smoking? Is it uh, cancer? Is it age? Is it gender? Is, uh, what are the factors that uh, uh, in, increase the uh, the comorbidities of something like like COVID. Uh, you can't do that with one record. You've got to look at 10,000 records to do that. So that that's the advantage of being able to uh, to, to look at uh, uh, 10,000 records at the same time. What do you lose? Uh, you lose. You lose. That's that's a good question. Uh, 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 what do you lose? There's 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 something called stop words. You lose your stop words. Stop words are words like a and the two four that are necessary for human communication, but don't have any uh, context. Uh, uh, don't have any relationship to uh, the 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 conversation that's occurring. That. Uh, uh, but we need them for proper pronunciation and getting ideas across, but we don't need them for understanding uh, what's going on in the uh, conversation. The second thing that you lose is, uh, 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 is, is complete accuracy, that language is imperfect. And I don't, I don't care who you are or, or, or what language you're in, language is imperfect. And I can give you example after example. So if you're looking for perfection, if you're looking for a hundred percent accurate interpretation of what's being said, you're not going to find it. It, 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 it. And I don't use the word impossible lightly, but but it is impossible to 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 do a completely one hundred percent interpretation and understanding of language. Now, can you do ninety percent? God, I hope so. Uh, 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 but 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 can you do a hundred percent? That last ten percent uh, becomes something that uh, I've not seen anybody be able to do, and I think I can say uh, it, it's it's impossible. And I don't use the word impossible lightly. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, and superficially. And I'd love to dig into this field more, but my guess is that you can extract a lot of categorical type data out of this text, especially at, conditions that are common. So, you know, cancer. Type. If you're looking at 10,000 people and you yeah. find that uh, uh, 9,990 of those people uh, uh, say one thing, it really doesn't matter what the other 10 people say. Uh, and, and, and is that inaccurate? Yes, that's inaccurate. Uh, but statistically, it's still significant. 
Well, I mean, I guess this has always been the issue with data, right? Like data is an imperfect representation of medical records and business processes and everything else. And yet data warehousing has still had value because it gives you a much better picture than you would have without having like some kind of systematic process to look we, at what's going on. We, we have this wonderful lady that worked for us and I love her, but she is a perfectionist and she and I have these arguments. She said, but Bill, <laughs> you, we interpret it this way. And I said, yes, I'm not going to name her name. Although if she sees this broadcast, she'll know who I'm being talking about. I think but so. uh, 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 but I, I, I tell her, I said, I said, you know, she said, Bill, we're not doing this right. It's not perfect. And, and, and I almost have to throttle her. I don't, I don't go around throttling people, but uh, I almost have to throttle her because she insists on perfection and language there, there are things in language that just aren't perfect. Uh, that's, that's just the way it is. Just always, so I'm, I think I came across the, this original notion of yours. Uh, what was it called? Textual disambiguation. I think it was. Uh, yep. You wrote a paper in, I think it's 2009, if I'm if memory serves me correctly, or around there. Yeah. So, I, I guess you, you know, you've you've seen a lot of things in data. Like what? What gave you the inspiration to focus on this area? Um, well, Joe, one day, a, a long time ago, I was sitting down and I, and, and I drew a little diagram. I said, okay, here's the data in the corporation. Here is structured data and here is unstructured data, textual data. And, and I said, this is really strange because 90 some odd percent of the decisions in the corporation are being made on 10% or less of the data in the corporation. Mm. And it's like, gee, does that make sense? And said, no, it didn't make sense to me. And then it started me to investigate why. Why is tech so hard to handle? And, and so it was really curiosity on my part and, and, and it's curiosity on my part. That's really cool because this is also a time I think it was it was definitely before um, you know data science, machine learning, AI were in vogue. I think that happened you know around kind of the mid 2010s, but this is well before that. Um, so this, that is, means, this this is before that, yes. Right. Yeah. So I mean that's pretty cool in a lot of ways. I mean just to you know I think sit there and be like, huh, that's interesting. <laughs> Why have we not started addressing this giant elephant in the room? Um, oh, and, and it's an elephant in the room that people have ignored for years. Why do you think they ignore it? Uh, the main reason why is most people are led by their vendors. Most people do what their vendors tell them to do and vendors don't have a good answer. So vendors don't tell them to go, go look into that, or, that, that arena, but that's changing. Well, I mean, I think the data lake, the original vision of the data lake was intended to partially solve this problem. People captured a bunch of text data. The question is, why did those efforts fail? I mean, I think part of it was that at first you were dealing with tools like MapReduce, which writing manual MapReduce jobs was kind of a nightmare, frankly. And then you had tools like Pig, and they Pig just didn't get the job done in terms of actual sophisticated textual analysis in general. I don't know what's your opinion on that as far as data lakes went. I feel like a lot of people collected a lot of text data. Some really sophisticated organizations did something with it, but a lot of it just sat around. It, you mentioned textual disambiguation. It has taken me 20 years to build the technology that we have that does textual disambiguation. It is most organizations, even big, rich, powerful organizations, don't have the patience or the uh, desire Nobody wants a project that takes 20 years to develop, and which goes to show what a stubborn person I am. The two most stubborn people I've ever met in my life are my mother and my father, and 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 I, I come by stubbornness honestly, and so does my daughter and my the other people in my family. We are stubborn people, and 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 it's taken. 20 years to figure out how to do textual disambiguation. So uh, uh, people just don't have the uh, stubbornness that we have. Interesting. I actually got a question here from uh, my friend Matt Deaver. He asks, um, 
Uh, isn't text processing usually ignored because the problem is extremely difficult and the gain is very low? That's been um, his experience, at least. Uh, what are your thoughts? <laughs> uh, if you know how to do it, if you know how to do textual disambiguation, uh, the gain is very high. Uh, 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 so the problem is extremely difficult. Boy, I boy, can I agree with that? Oh, yes, sir. That is absolutely correct. But uh, 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 once... I mean, I mean, I, 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 I mentioned medical records. The gain in medical records is to be able to do medical research in, a, in, a, 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 in an extremely uh, uh, efficient fashion. And, 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 you know, how can you put a, even put a dollar value on that? I mean, that's, that's people's health that you're talking about. Uh, uh, but I can, and that's only one example of, of what we're talking about uh, in terms of the gain. So the gain is high. People just, people haven't spent the 20 years that it took to learn how to do textual disambiguation. How does this differ from NLP? I think that's going to be a question. Can we get another question here, um, Christine? Like, how can AI better address problems that result from threats to construct validity? Um, I know before the chat, we were talking about uh, NLP and what's, whatnot. What, what are your thoughts on, on that approach? With all due respect to NLP, NLP was never designed as a commercial product. NLP was designed as a technology to study language, not to produce results. And trying to take NLP and turn it into a commercial product is, is one of the more frustrating things that you can, uh, can ever do. And, and so uh, 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 the difference between NLP and, and textual disambiguation as we do it is that NLP is expensive. NLP requires a lot of consulting time. NLP is complex and cumbersome. On the other hand, textual disambiguation is inexpensive, fast, and, and simple. Uh, uh, and and, and, and in, uh, textual disambiguation was designed to be a commercial product. Interesting. Actually, got a question here from Mark Keeling. What's up, Mark? Good morning. Um, he says, totally new to textual disambiguation here. Um, what are tools out there? Um, what are the varying approaches to solving this? Again, at the risk of uh, appearing to be self-serving, uh, you asked the question, so I'll tell you the answer. You need to look into something called forest rim technology. Uh, forest rim technology uh, works in the arena of healthcare. Uh, the other arena that we work in is what we call voice of the customer, uh, going out to the internet and finding out what people are saying about uh, products and companies and their services uh, 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 and their other arenas we work in. Uh, but the two main ones are uh, healthcare and and uh, uh, listening to what customers are saying and feeding that back to to management. But but look up forest rim technology and you will discover a whole new world. Question. Um, that's really interesting. And so what do you, what's been the adoption like of, of uh, text ambiguation? We were talking about this too, and this kind of ties into um, a segue uh, kind of about geographies, but we, we, you noted some pretty interesting adoption patterns. Um, uh, yeah, uh, let, me, let me tell you that universally, uh, when we talk to technicians, uh, they have a deaf ear. The people that want to do the kinds of things that can be done with text are the end user themselves. Uh, uh, we, we talk to doctors. Uh, we talk to administrators of hospitals. Uh, we talk to marketing people. Uh, we talk to the direct end user. And I don't know why it is that the... the, the the same pattern existed for data warehouse. I don't know if you know this about data warehouse, but uh, data warehouse in the first two or three years of data warehousing uh, was not accepted at all by the IT community. Uh, uh, it was the marketing people. God bless the marketing people. It was the marketing people uh, that saw the value. And if it hadn't been for marketing people, we wouldn't have data warehouse today. But the same pattern is occurring today. Uh, we, 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 I'll, I'll, maybe I shouldn't say this, but it's the truth. Uh, whenever we do initial presentations to organization, we politely request that the IT people not even be there 
uh, mm. because uh, 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 we want to talk to the business people, the management, and the people that are solving business problems. And and you know that's a reflection on the IT department that 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 really disturbs me. I come from the IT department in in the old in the old days and in, in the early d- uh, dawns of our, uh, our 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 industry. Uh, once upon a time, the IT people took great pride in being a part of the business. Uh, let me tell you a little story. This is this is the gospel truth. I was talking to somebody at a large telecommunications company the other day in IT, and I, I mentioned. You're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you, but I'm telling you the truth. Uh, I mentioned the word customer, and this guy in IT said, customer? Do we have customers? And and, and I go, <laughs> yeah, you have customers. And and he didn't even know that his company had customers. And I don't, I, I, I'm telling you the truth. No, I know you are. It's, it's, I'm, it's, I'm not making it's, this it's up. Bananas. And, and I know it's bananas, And and uh, but the IT department, has gotten to be so far removed from the business uh, that that uh, they think of them existing uh, uh, on on their own. I, I I think the reason for it is uh, year, years ago when and I'm I'm one of the original. I started uh, in 1965 is when I wrote my first program, uh, but in 1965 uh, computers came onto this earth. And 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 that that in 1960 65 time frame, and and people didn't know what to do with with the computer, and 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 especially the people, the people that were actually trained and qualified to uh, talk uh, about computers, uh, the, the, there weren't many of them, and and organizations couldn't pay these people the the rate at which the the market would pay. And so instead of waiting for an annual raise, computer people found, oh, gee, it's just easier for me to just go to another company and get a 15 percent raise. And, yeah. and, 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 and that happened. And I think that that was the origin of this attitude that uh, IT people uh, work for um, uh, work for uh, uh, the, their, the, 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 the technology rather than the company. Mm. I, I'm sure there are other factors as well. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think to Joe and I, um, our, our thought is that the missing link in data modeling right now is that it's considered strictly an analytics problem. In other words, the application side, so say IT does its data modeling for its application, and then analytics and machine learning and data engineering are expected to just take whatever comes downstream and try to turn it into something useful. And yep. there, there is a lot of that, like kind of lobbying a lot the wall. Of that, so yeah, yeah, it's your problem now. It's Have your problem day. now. Instead of like, hey, how can we format the, math this data so it's good for the application, but also good for analytics? I would say more, and more enlightened companies, though that's yeah. not the case. But no, I would no, say I in a lot of these uh, kind of companies that um, you know might be kind of asleep at the wheel, this certainly happens where uh, IT is just... I don't know. It's kind of it's kind of this weird fiefdom onto its own. You know, I don't know who, I don't know who they serve. So. Uh, and and I, I think the origins of that are uh, the way hiring practices occurred a long time ago. That people had loyalty to the vendor and to the vendor's technology. They didn't even know what their company did. And this this guy the other day, and I'm not kidding you. I I, I at at a large. Uh, a telecommunications company, he said, customers, we have customers. And I, and I, I thought, give me a break. Who do you think you're working for? And it wasn't the company and it sure wasn't, he didn't know there were even customers or what. Anyway, don't I get me that guy from office space that, uh, yeah. probably, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's still out there somewhere. That's awesome. Actually got a question from Mark Freeman here, uh, back related to a uh, text, um, he says, can you talk more about your healthcare use case? Um, how do you handle the extreme level of uh, data inconsistency, repeats, and mismatched data systems? <laughs> uh, that's part of textual disambiguation. Part of textual disambiguation is the fact that uh, 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 there's many different ways to say the same thing. I like something. I want something. I love something. I hate something. And, 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 and that's one of the things that textual disambiguation does is, uh, is, is it reads 
and interprets the many different ways to say something and filters them down to a, uh, a to a consistent understanding of what's being said. And and I, I mentioned it took 20 years to figure out how to do this. And and uh, it's not a, if you think this is a simple problem, you're wrong. This is not a simple problem. Uh, 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 and so uh, uh, in, in the hardest part, uh, quite frankly, of textual disambiguation uh, uh, is, 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 is context. Uh, con- I don't know if you want me to go into it, but uh, context is easily the most difficult part of, of, um, uh, of dealing with, uh, with text. But the problem of inconsistency, the problem of of uh, people of the ninety different ways there are to say the same thing, um, uh, uh, th- that's probably the second biggest problem with dealing with with text. Interesting. We were also talking, you know, kind of before we got started, um, sort of about the future of uh, of text. What, what what do you think it's going? Um. When you take a look at the the demographic chart of the data we have in a corporation, structured data only makes up, depends on the corporation, anywhere between 5 and 10% of the data in the corporation. 90% of the data in the corporation uh, is in the form of text. And so I, I, uh, I, what, I'll tell you what I liken text to. I liken text to California in 1848. We are told by reasonable people that, that have a, a credibility that in 1848, you could walk along the streams of California and just pick up gold. I mean, and, and I guess I believe that. I've heard that. And then one day in 1849, uh, gold was discovered in California and the world made a, a dash to, to California. And and you can't do that anymore today. But I, I liken the looking at text to California in 1848. There's a gold mine out there just waiting to be picked up, and 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 that's that's where we're at today. Uh, I, I get asked by students graduating from college, uh, uh, asking where should I place my career. Where's the most most propitious place to uh, uh, to go looking for opportunity for myself? And I tell them, go look in text because nobody else is looking there, mm. and that's where the gold is. And and uh, 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 and and so anyway. So give me your opinion on this. Let's let's try to create a bit of controversy here. Not really. I don't think this is controversial. Why do you think IBM's Watson has struggled with text? I mean, this was one of their big uh, uh, marquee uh, uh, problems was yeah. medical records. Well, it was their big marquee product, too. It's like, this was like, oh, exactly. yeah, we're going to change yeah. the world. And I mean, I think they just there are about it. 18 reasons why IBM, <clears throat> I mean, let I me mean, I mean, start with a little story with you. A long time ago, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago, when we were first starting our journey with text, uh, I was doing a presentation in San Diego and 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 this 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 uh, uh, gentleman came up to me at the end of my presentation. He was a vice president at IBM, and 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 I, I and he said to me, he says, "Oh, we're working on text as well." I said, "Oh, that's interesting." I said, "Maybe we could collaborate and do some work together." And he looked at me and he said, "Bill, you have to understand, IBM is a big, rich, smart company. We don't think you could add anything to what IBM is, is saying and doing." And and the arrogance of, of of IBM, and and that again that conversation actually occurred, and wow. and so uh, I can tell you there's about eight major things that that IBM did wrong. The first thing that they did wrong was uh, uh, they made it a monolithic product. They wanted something to replace uh, uh, IMS and CICS and some of those things like that. And, and, and that's the first mistake they made. The second mistake they made is when they went to say, gee, who knows about text? Where can we find out about it? And I have nothing against Stanford or Berkeley, but they, they, they went over to Stanford and Berkeley and got professors that, that, that were the NLP uh, uh, professors of the world. Now, I'm going to tell you, 
uh, the 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 uh, uh, NLP was never designed for being a, a commercial product. And I happen to know a lot of those professors at Stanford and Berkeley. They're good friends of mine. They really and truly are. But these people have never built a system before. They're good at writing books. They're good at teaching classes. They're good at do, delivering papers and whatever. But in terms of building a commercial system, these people don't know what they're doing. And so IBM went out. I, I, I've seen estimates that IBM spent $2 billion dollars on the develop, you know that IBM no longer has Watson. I'm sure you right, know they did. Yeah, got rid of it. Yep. And 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 uh, they spent two. Uh, Bill Inman could have saved them several billion dollars by having a little bit of common sense, saying, "Gee, guys, we don't want to build a monolithic product. Uh, we want to build something that's that that's usable." Number one and number two, using IBM Watson was a. Uh, 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 an extremely cumbersome and complex thing to do. And so uh, uh, you don't want to build that. You want something that's simple, inexpensive, fast, and, 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 and Watson was anything but simple, inexpensive, and fast. So I, I hark back to that day that guy from IBM said, gee, Bill, IBM is a big, rich, smart company. Uh, uh, we don't think you could add anything to what we're doing. So we're going to go out and spend two billion dollars uh, 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 and end up with a big mess. Yeah, the funny thing about IBM is that they often seem to have the vision of what's coming in the future, but then the execution is lacking. So I have a good friend who worked at IBM for a long time, and this was clear back in like 1990s. I was just like a teenager back there, back then, and uh, this was before the internet had really taken off in the United States. And he's like, "Yeah, what IBM sees happening in the future is we're mostly going to be going to a client-server model of computing. In other words," People are going to access, you know, centralized backend network services, and then they'll experience that on their local computer, and they'll somehow, he didn't call it the web or anything like that, but like he basically was talking about the web and, and mobile devices and all these things that were in the future, but how big a slice of that business does IBM have now? Not, not a whole lot, I think. Yeah, I, remember so, playing, I remember playing the yeah. Watson uh, Jeopardy game. They had it at, at a conference I was at. My sister and I, uh, I played it. I thought it was cool. I mean, it was a good party cool. trick for yeah. sure, um, but it obviously didn't translate. And, well to, and, and I'm going to tell you the success that they had on Jeopardy uh, 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 was amazing. But 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 what they were doing on Jeopardy was not the same problem right. that people are solving in business. And uh, by the way, speaking of that Jeopardy thing, I, I happen to be friends with Roger Craig. Uh, I don't know if you know that the... Uh, uh, the two people that that played the Watson machine were Roger Craig and Ken Jennings, mm. and uh, and one day I was at speaking at a conference in New York City, and there were it was a I don't know 500 people there or something like that, and at the end of the conference this man came up to me and it shook my hand and said, "Gee, Bill, I really enjoyed your presentation," and it was Roger Craig, and and uh, he's in our I, I don't know if you know this but he's in our profession, he's a data scientist and. Mm. Uh, uh, and I, I've had several dealings with him over the years. Uh, a very nice, very smart person. And, and was obviously a very smart person. That's cool. Interesting. Kind of switching gears a bit, um, Scott Taylor has a question here. Um, what do you think of the whole debate uh, with data mesh movement, uh, with the data mesh movement that seems to say data warehousing is dead? Well, uh, people have been trying to kill data warehousing for a long time. Uh, I wish them a lot of luck. Let me tell you when data warehousing is going to die. Data warehousing is going to die when people need no longer need believable information. If, if, if what you want is just to get information, to access information, then you don't need a data warehouse. You need a data mesh. But uh, if, if, if uh, in fact, what I tell people that bring up this argument about data mesh, I said, you ought to write all of your systems in Excel because Excel is a good way to get a lot of information quickly up on the computer. You can share that information. That's wonderful. Can you believe the information? Listen, I can take an Excel spreadsheet and assign myself a salary of a million dollars a month, and that's it's on the computer. It's on an Excel spreadsheet. So why shouldn't you? And I can share that with you. Not a problem. Is that reality? Nowhere near is that a reality. So as long as people need believable 
information on which to make decisions, they're going to need a data warehouse. And <coughs> I, the, the, the people at Data Mesh, I, 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 I think it's very unfortunate that uh, uh, they've chosen to think they're going to replace Data Warehouse. If they had said, gee, we can coexist with Data Warehouse, we can operate in a complementary fashion, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> we can operate in a complementary fashion, I think that would have been a really good thing to say. Uh, but, but let's take a look at what happened with big data. Uh, uh, big mm -hmm. data came along, Cloudera, uh, uh, and those other companies that I can't remember who their names are today um, uh, came along okay. <laughs> and, 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 and and said that, uh, uh, gee, we're going to replace Data Warehouse. And uh, 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 quite frankly, uh, Cloudera, uh, I recommend Cloudera all the time, but not for what they, they think I recommend them for. If you want to use Cloudera <coughs> as a secondary source for storing data that has low probability of access, that's actually a wonderful extension for a data warehouse. But no, 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 no. Uh, Cloudera is going to replace data warehouse. And that didn't work out. Data Mesh is going to replace data warehouse. That's not going to work out. So so uh, uh, I, I think if people would come along with the attitude that we're going to operate in a complementary fashion, uh, that's going to be much better. I don't know what it is about data warehouse that everybody wants to kill or replace data warehouse and uh, uh, and and data warehouse is still standing today. Yeah, actually, Scott has a good follow up comment here. Scott and I talk a lot about zero sum stuff, and it, it, it shouldn't have to be a zero sum conflict, That's right? With, so, with, yeah. with anything, right? I mean, because I've seen this over my career too. Where I think I'd like to get your take on this too. I know you have a very specific definition of a data warehouse yep right very specific we talk about this actually you know you and i and it's it, it but what what i see is that it seems that it's been co-opted quite often and i'm not sure you know the term has thrown around a lot what what do you think about that well let me tell you something the definition of data warehouse and has never changed and 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 people, people, Teradata's come along and try to fiddle with it and uh, data mesh and uh, uh, Lord knows uh, uh, Ralph Kimball's come along and tried to, to, to change the definition of data warehouse. A data warehouse definition still stands today. And, and by the way, it amazes me that that's been the case because uh, 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 because um, uh, when I wrote the de definition of a data warehouse, I just wrote that off the top of my head. And, and I mean, I mean, I had no idea that uh, it was going to cause the commotion that, that it's caused. I, I'm not kidding. I mean, I said, okay, what's a data warehouse? Well, and, and this was in the early days. I, I know a lot more today than I knew in the very early days of data warehouse, but uh, uh, the definition hasn't changed. And, uh, um, what can I say? Again, if people want believable data, they need it. If, if you don't care about believable data, if you want to just take everything off of an Excel spreadsheet, then be my guest. You don't need a data warehouse. And I think this is part of the reason that the data warehouse has attracted disdain. You're kind of emphasizing the business process aspect of like, we need to make sure that the data is correct before we provide it to other parts of the organization. Yep. And I think that's very valuable. I think when people have gatekeepers and they can't then do their own things with data in parallel, they get very frustrated. And so that was kind of what motivated that discussion of like, well, that's cloud era should kill the data warehouse because we are getting frustrated with change departments taking six months to happen. Whereas we can have both systems, if we can have data mesh and data warehousing to say, here's the very dynamic data coming out of different um, application development teams within the company. But then here's kind of the, the golden assessed data yeah. that the whole company can look at that's governed. That, that actually, this is really cool that this idea of running these two in parallel. Well, it's yeah. also kind of reality, right? It is, yeah. So she, um, Mike Rogoff, he, uh, so Mike. He has a good question here. Um, what, in your view, is the most effective way to scale uh, making the data believable? Well, uh, from the beginning, we've never said build your data warehouse all at once. 
uh, go mm-hmm. into your organization, uh, do an assessment as to uh, what your most critical data is, and start with that, and then work your way to the next most critical data. And so uh, you need to build a data warehouse incrementally. And uh, in the early days, you don't get this much anymore, but in the early days of data warehousing, uh, people would come along and say, oh, you've got to build, you've got to boil all of the ocean at the same time. We never said that. I don't know where that came from, but uh, 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 that was just people wanting to not build a data warehouse. And and so uh, 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 you, you need to, to be strategic about it. You need to be incremental about it. You need to uh, uh, be strategic and incremental and and take it a step at a time. There's an old saying, how do you eat an elephant? If you try to eat an elephant all at once, you will die because you'll choke to death. Uh, you eat an elephant a bite at a time. Yeah, I think it's... it's... It tends to be the kind of the tendency, though, right, for I would say, especially IT led projects to kind of bring it back to IT. Um, you know, a lot of these seem to be just sort of uh, I hate to use the term make work projects, but it's definitely something where people be like, OK, we got to um, take this initiative. We got to, um, as you say, boil the ocean. And then it I don't know, it's I think it just ends up being kind of a graveyard at the end of the day. And, of the and uh, 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 another ploy that was used in the early days of data warehousing uh, uh, is the, in the transformation process. Uh, uh, in order to build a data warehouse, transformation of data is a necessity. It's just simply the price you pay for a data warehouse. So what the IT department would do is go and find the most difficult transformation that they could find and say, look, we can't transform data. You can't you can't take this process and 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 automate it or transform it, and and uh, and they were right that, that some processes are so complex you you really can't do anything with them. But but ninety eight percent of the processes are simple things, and so the IT department tried to use this excuse: well, you can't transform everything right off the bat, so therefore we can't do it at all. And uh, that was a uh, that was a crummy little excuse. Mm. That, again, the IT people, when, when, when Data Warehouse first started, uh, the IT people resisted Data Warehouse as hard as they could. It was the people in marketing, sales, and finance that, uh, 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 that, that helped Data Warehouse. Well, and it's interesting that, that Data Warehousing has so often been under a completely different silo part of the organization, separate from IT. And I think now that data has become cool again, um, we do see organizations trying to combine them more like, hey, IT wants a slice of that because it is cool to be working with a lot of data, whereas it used to be like, yeah, that's just for reporting. We don't want to deal with that. Well, the the, the data warehousing for the first five or maybe 10 years of data warehousing was never supported by the vendors. IBM went out of their way to, 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 to try to not support data warehouse. Oracle wasn't any better. Microsoft wasn't any better. So people listened to their vendors and their vendors did not like data warehouse. And uh, uh, so that's that. So the data warehouse has succeeded despite the best efforts of IBM, Oracle, uh, SAP, Microsoft, and all of those people. I remember those days too. You know, I remember the, uh, especially the big data days, it was like, SQL is going to die. Um, yeah, data warehousing, that's long gone. And um, yeah. That's right. <laughs> so, and, here, and here we stand today. Here we stand today. Mark Freeman has another question here. Um, what are your thoughts on DBT and transformations moving towards being mostly in the data warehouse? I think to extend this conversation a bit, I think it's more um, of an ETL or ELT approach. Um, well, yeah. Um... Uh, as you probably know, I'm not a big fan of ELT. Uh, wh- why am I not a big fan of ELT? Uh, it's because because vendors want something that doesn't require the brain and doesn't require work. They, they want the cheap, fast, easy way out. And so what they discovered was, gee, if we just do ELT, uh, we can do the E and we can do the L. And we'll just conveniently forget to do the T. 
and and uh, 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 and that uh, uh, has been the, the the vendor's way to sell a lot of stuff. Uh, but it's not a data warehouse that they're selling. You do an e now 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 there are a few people out there that actually do the transformation part in mm-hmm. ELT, and for them, God bless them. Uh, God bless them. But 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 most people do the E and the L and said, oh, we're through uh, 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 and 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 we won't do any transformation. So uh, um, now now I will say this much transformation can occur in lots of places. It doesn't have to be at, at where it's currently located. You can do uh, transformation as you bring the data in, as you stream it in. Uh, you can do transformation in other places, but uh, but at some point in time, you are stuck doing the transformation, and 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 transformation work is 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 dirty work. You get your hands dirty doing transformation, and as far as I can tell, there's no way out of that. There's there's uh, I don't know if somebody's got a good way to do transformation that's easy and and fast and cheap, please let me know because I'm, I want to know about it, but uh, I've not found one yet. Yeah. I mean, transformation fundamentally is a quality problem that comes down to a lot of attention to detail. I mean, yeah, anyone can write a quick SQL query to do a transformation, but to make it consistent across business logic and to make sure that the data is correct, that comes out. But that's also why we always talk about too, transformations where you start getting ROI out of your data and start getting the value out of Uh, it. That's exactly right. It's that transformation process that uh, is the shaping factor for a real data warehouse. Mm-hmm. And I, I was going to say with, with ELT, I think there are kind of two main definitions. There was the, the da- original data like definition, which was transform on read, basically like transform on query, which to your point, Bill, it's going to be completely inconsistent if you do that. And yep. then there's the other version, which is actually do the transformation in the data warehouse, but it's really just ETL just with a management tool that hits the data warehouse rather than somewhere else. And sometimes some people call that ELTL, but then you start getting some of the acronyms flooding around. Yeah, so ELTL, LL. Yeah, <laughs> just keep like, adding stop. stuff on the end. <laughs> so, so. Yeah. I, I like ETL because ETL forces you into mm-hmm. the discipline of, 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 of transformation. Having stated that, I, I know a couple of organizations that do ELT properly. And again, mm-hmm. God bless them. That's cool. We were talking about this too, you know, um, I think, especially with the rise of streaming and, and the increasing popularity of it, I, I think you're actually going to see transformation becoming back in vogue um, because I don't know how else it would really work. So, And you're, you're talking like external transformation before it even reaches stage because you want it to be semi real time. Yes. You want it to be now you're just, yeah. as it arrives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But I hope you're right, but that goes against human nature. Human nature for a designer of a system says, gee, I'm the designer of a system. I can call this and and calculate this however I want. And when you talk about transformation, uh, uh, you can't do that. You take away that 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 prerogative of the uh, of the developer and developers don't like that. Taken away. Yeah, that's a fair point. Actually, got quite a few people asking about this article that you just wrote. Um, let me see if I can share it real quick here. Um, let's see here on Snowflake here. Snowflake, a critique. Um, for full disclosure, Ternary Data is a partner with Snowflake, but uh, they like us because we're uh, we're candid. So um, yeah, what? The, the, a lot in the chat here. There's been a lot of um, uh, commentary, and I and I over when this uh, article dropped a, a few days ago, a lot of friends are texting me like, "Hey, did you see Bill's new article? What are your thoughts on this?" And I was like, "Well, why don't you tune in on Monday and we can talk to Bill about this article?" Um, yeah. Well, surely. Uh, let me tell you uh, what uh, uh, caused the article to be written. Uh, 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 Snowflake, as far as I can tell is a general purpose database management systems. Can you build a data warehouse with Snowflake? Yes, you can. Can you build a data mark with Snowflake? Yes, you can. Can you build other kinds of systems with Snowflake? Yes, you can. 
So that's my understanding. If I'm wrong about that, please let me know. The problem is, is that Snowflake advertises themselves as a data warehouse uh, on the cloud company. And th so here's, so day one, somebody reads it. Aha, Snowflake, data warehouse on the cloud. Sounds good to me. Day two, somebody comes along and builds a, uh, a, a data mart or some other thing. Day three, the people become very unhappy with what they built. Day four, data uh, 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 data warehouse gets the blame that uh, uh, that uh, people don't recognize uh, that they can build something far different from a data warehouse with Snowflake. And 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 what 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 irritated me. Uh, and was I irritated when I wrote that article? Yes, I was. And that, uh, it probably comes across in the article. What I'm irritated with is I'm tired of people going out there, building a piece of junk, uh, and then data warehousing get the blame for it. Uh, consulting firms are especially guilty about this. I'm not going to name the names of consulting firms, but we all know who they are. And, and consulting firms go out there read a few buzzwords, uh, say, I, I can go sell my services now for a high amount of money. Uh, they go out there and build a piece, excuse my language, a piece of crap for, for, for people that's out there. And, 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 and then when the thing falls apart and fails, they say, oh, data warehouse doesn't work. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't like that, that, that uh, uh, they never built a data warehouse in the first place and yet data warehouse is, the, is the, the blame. It's like your neighbor robbing a bank and then the police coming and arresting you uh, for, for the bank robbery. It's like, wait a minute, I didn't do anything. I wasn't even there. And, and, and oh, but you're, you live next door to this person, so you must be guilty. Interesting. So, so your critique is basically the same critique that you would have for any technology vendor of MPP systems, say a critique you would have of Teradata, Oracle, or anyone else, that the technology itself doesn't give you a data warehouse. It just gives but you the, the, the yeah. other technologies don't advertise themselves as a data warehouse. They, they, they advertise themselves as uh, uh, something, as a, a full-scale database management system. If, let me tell you something. If Snowflake would have said, we're not, a, we're not a, a cloud data warehouse company, we are a cloud database management company, I wouldn't have a problem at all. Well, and I think uh, actually some uh, response here from Snowflake from Clark here. He says that uh, Snowflake does not advertise as a data warehouse in the cloud. Uh, Snowflake is the data cloud. So, um, but uh, I've kind of read the marketing for Snowflake, and that's kind of the impression that I got. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting, and it, it's. I think it's kind. Of, it kind of goes back to to the, um, you know, we we're talking earlier about sort of the the appropriation of the term data warehouse. Yeah. Um, I mean, is this is this just? Uh, do, you, do you see this as one more example of that? Where. Um, yep. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Um, no, what, what are your thoughts on this, Matt? Yeah, I mean, in general, I agree. No particular technology is. Uh, going to give you a data warehouse. Data warehouses are about processes. So, yeah. yeah. Data warehousing is an architecture. These other technologies are technology. And there's a fundamental difference between an architecture and a technology. And mm -hmm. I think, there, as far as I can tell, there's always going to be that kind of difference. Yeah, that's interesting too. I mean, because as, as uh, over the weekend, going back and reading through uh, uh, building the data warehouse um, uh, to uh, finish up a couple spots in the book, and, and I think that's absolutely right. Where it's the way you described it, it was um, very, I would say, technology agnostic. It's it's more of a paradigm. Like this is it, it is this is the practices, right? Yes, that's interesting. What are your thoughts on uh, uh, the lake house? Um. The lake house is kind of interesting. Uh, we started with data lakes, which I am, <laughs> I don't use the word hate a lot, but I really don't like data lakes. I, 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 uh, data lakes are a staging area. And the expectations that people put uh, uh, into data lakes is uh, 
um, uh, far exceeds anything that a staging area uh, could ever accomplish. So a data lake house is an extension of uh, data lakes with the infrastructure that you need for making analytical decisions. And so uh, I, I see a real distinction between data lakes and data lake house. I, I think data, data lakes are, are a travesty. Uh, uh, and I think that a data lake house stands a chance at giving an organization uh, what they need for making analytical decisions. Where, where do you think a, a lake house architecture fits in with um, uh, text data, for example? I think text data fits in like a hand in a glove with it. I mean, I think uh, uh, <coughs> in in the, the recent book that I had out on data lake house, uh, we said there's three components to a data lake house. There's structured data, uh, there's textual data, and there's analog IoT data. And those are the three kinds of data that we see going into a data lake house. Yeah, and I mean, the big difference is not just that you, I mean, to me is not just that you have structured data, but you have like a good layer for managing structured data. Because even in the data lake area, you could throw lots of structured data into your system. The problem is that it was so hard to track schemas and things like that without some tools around it. Uh, managing schema changes, like you managing any kind of updates was a huge nightmare back then. Oh, it was a giant nightmare. Well, that wasn't really happening. It's not fun like at all. Like... And then suddenly people are like, wow, the, these other MPP systems support, you know, schema changes really nicely, actually in table creation and updates and yep. it turned out to be pretty valuable. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's interesting. Cool. I think we're coming up on time. Um, man, anything you want to want to leave the audience with? Uh, well, um, yeah, I, I got an interesting email the other day, uh, uh, and and I, don't, I normally don't take emails personally, but this one email said, Bill, who is paying you? What vendor is paying you under the covers to make trouble for Snowflake? And I want to make it clear, there's no vendor out here that's paying me, and I'm not uh, uh, being influenced by any other vendor. Uh, that the 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 only the only motivation I had for writing the article about Snowflake was was to make sure that uh, when you fail with a data warehouse, you go check out the meaning of what a data warehouse was, because uh, mm -hmm. because with Snowflake you can build something I don't know what uh, that isn't a data warehouse. Don't blame data warehouse. That was the motivation for that. But uh, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I kind of resented the fact that people, somebody th thought that I'm on the take from some other vendor because mm -hmm. I, I, you know, ask my accountant and you will check my banking account and find out there's no vendor out there paying Bill and, Bill and me to do this. That's really interesting. How, how do you think we could better educate people on, on, the data warehouse then and what it means and what it's intended for. Well, there's a I've, lot of confusion. I've certainly done my part and, yeah. and, and, and the, uh, uh, the confusion I think comes from vendors wanting to co-opt it. Uh, uh, vendors want to say, Oh, that sounds like my technology. If we just change this and this and this, we can call whatever I do a data warehouse. Well, the problem is the, the things that they change are, are are, uh, are are robbing uh, a data warehouse of being a data warehouse, and and uh, so uh, I, I think the confusion is caused by uh, vendors wanting to jump on the train, and I think mm -hmm. it's really ironical. You know, I'm, I'm, we mentioned IBM, I, I I I and I don't want to dwell on IBM, but IBM fought. Ted Codd and other people at IBM uh, fought Data Warehouse tooth and nail. And in terms of selling IBM hardware and services, Data Warehouse has probably sold more than anything you'd ever imagine. And so mm -hmm. I thought, this is really funny because they, they IBM did not support and still doesn't support Data Warehouse, yet they make a lot of money off of it. I hope in my life someday I reach the point where there's something that I don't like that I get rich from uh, and still don't like it. I, I, I hope that happens. I doubt that it will, but you never can tell. 
Interesting. Just kind of closing out too. I mean, how many books have you written? Uh, nonfiction books, 63 fiction books, too. Wait, you've written fiction books? Um, yes. <laughs> I, I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea either. That's really cool. Um, you know, I'm just as an aside, like what, that's a lot of books. Um, I mean, I'm trying to do the, the math in that, but that's like at least two a year or something like that. Yeah, or how long have you been writing like for? That. Yeah. What, well, what keeps you going on that? That's... Le, well, let me tell you something. I come from a family that's a writer. My sister mm. has written 28 books. My father yeah. wrote 10 <laughs> books. And one of our one of our year ago, many years ago, uh, family members was Edgar Allan Poe. So I'm what? I'm I'm a, he was my great 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 whatever uh, uh, grandfather. So uh, uh, and my and I had a niece that that was a, a screenwriter in in Hollywood. So uh, we I, I come from a, a family of writers. That's interesting. I had no idea. That's cool. Um, it just must be in the blood then. <laughs> so. uh, you know, some people play golf. Some people walk their dog. I write. I, I, I find writing to be completely relaxing and to me, and I know that for most people, writing is work. Uh, for me, writing is, uh, is a pleasure. And, and, and again, it's my hobby in life. I mean, I, I think I enjoy it too. It's, uh, it's more fun when you're not on deadline, <laughs> not uh, editing your own work and those kinds of things, but that's true. They're all, yeah. Necessary things to actually turn writing into a product into something that other people can consume. Do you mostly yeah. self-publish these days or do you still go through publishers? Oh, uh, no, I've always gone through a publisher. Okay, cool. And, 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 uh, um, uh, I started off with uh, Prentice Hall. Uh, uh, I did then, and then I, I can't even remember. The, the the names of all of them. Macmillan I think did one of mm -hmm. my books uh, uh, and, and now I'm with Technics and Steve Hoberman and Technics I don't know if you know mm -hmm. Steve Hoberman but uh, you should uh, Steve Hoberman is first off a great guy uh, but but he's got the largest collection of of uh, of authors for technology of any company and uh, uh, so you should you should be in touch with Steve Hoberman. Interesting. That's cool. Um, yeah, I'll have to pick your brain about uh, the writing process. It's something Matt and I are um, still, <laughs> I think still learning. Figure, I mean, yeah. I think we made it work, right? We've gotten this. Yeah, today's far, actually so. like, literally in about two hours is the deadline for yeah, our yeah, book. Yeah, so. So. <laughs> Sound, sounds good. Yeah, but awesome. Well, thanks, Bill. It's always good to chat with you. Okay. Um, yeah, looking forward to catching up soon. So. Thank you. Talk to you guys later. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.